This is the current federal tax developments for the week of March the 22nd, 2021. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your State Society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and we're going to be talking this week here in Phoenix about various uh, things that have happened during the week. It's been an interesting week, to say the least. And we'll go through a few things. Probably the big one will be right at the end. But first, we did have the IRS release instructions on how to report the unemployment exclusion that was passed as part of the American Recovery Program Act. That particular instructions is now being implemented by many pieces of tax software. Not all of them yet have implemented the fix, but it's beginning to roll out through different pieces of software. At least announcements are being made about when it will come out in a piece of software. The IRS, all, I should say, the AICPA issued a letter giving various recommendations about how to treat Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness for certain issues on partnership and S corporation returns. And finally, yeah, the big story of the week, the IRS relented, finally gave in and decided barely to push back the filing deadline by a month and do it, but in a very limited fashion. And we'll discover there is a lot of stuff that is not going to be extended that you'd be working toward on April 15th. So you may not want to celebrate quite as much as you might otherwise. So again, going to be one of those fun things because included among the stuff that's not being pushed back are the quarter one 2021 estimated tax payments, at least for now. So let's go hit on hit the first thing here, which is we have a new exclusion of up to 10,200 of unemployment compensation. The IRS posts on their website. Uh, This was here on March 12th. And the big issue here was the IRS finally gave, or I should say, shouldn't say finally, it really wasn't that long, one day after the bill was signed, uh, posted the instructions for how to handle reporting the unemployment compensation exclusion. Now, as you're aware, we had an exclusion of up to $10,200 from income for taxpayers with adjusted gross income, or I should say modified adjusted gross income, of less than $150,000. And, but the problem was, how do we report that now? Because it's retroactive into last year. In fact, it only covers last year. So we have a lot of returns, a lot of issues. We have returns that have already been filed, where unemployment has been reported, and the taxpayer has included taxable income, where now it appears it shouldn't be. Plus, we still have some returns to file that are going to be reporting unemployment compensation. Well, the IRS is going to deal with that second category first, those that have not yet filed. The IRS issued updated instructions for Schedule 1, Form 1040, Line 7. So the updated instructions for that were posted on the IRS's website. And what it tells you to do is essentially get rid of the Line 7 instructions that are currently there in the uh, Schedule 1 instructions and use these instead. Now, these instructions make it clear you will still report the full amount of unemployment compensation on Line 7. Line 7, Schedule 1, is the line where unemployment compensation goes, and we're not going to take it off the return. One key issue here is that the IRS really does need to have a way to quickly run the math to make sure that the exclusion has been properly calculated. So one of the things they need to know is how much unemployment are you claiming you received. That's where line seven tells them the unemployment in question. Then they say you go ahead and using a worksheet, you compute how much of that unemployment is not subject to tax. And you will put that amount as a negative number on line eight. And you'll label it UCE, which is unemployment compensation, you know, except exemption, I guess is what we'll say the three stand for. And you're supposed to put the amount you're reducing it in parentheses. Line 8 is normally the other income line, so this is going to be a subtraction. Now, if the only thing you have there is the description will have like negative $10,200, and then the actual line will have negative $10,200. But it's possible you have actual other income and other details, so that's why the IRS wants in this special format that description of UCE Don't spell it out. It's just U-C-E, and then in parentheses, this subtraction. 
Now, the good news about this is you actually could go ahead, even if your software is not updated, and probably get one that will go all the way through electronic filing, no confusion to the service, and the service would pick it up properly. And I'm sure some people are tempted to do that. But there are a couple of problems with that. Problem one is that we really have a bunch of states that have not yet told us, and probably it's going to be a while for states that are static conformity states, to tell us what they're going to do about this unemployment compensation. Are they going to go ahead and not tax it? Are they going to tax it? We don't know that right now. And generally, if we're filing a federal return, we're going to be filing a state return. And there's that little problem that you might not want to jump on right away until you get some feel as to which way your state's going. As well, some departments of revenue uh, work this differently. Probably the majority are going to want you to add it back unless and until and unless the legislature passes a program that says, yep, we're going to go ahead and treat that as non-taxable, and it's signed into law. Other states, including my home state of Arizona, work just the opposite. My guess is the Arizona Department of Revenue is going to assume that Arizona will conform, which is interesting because the last time this happened in 2009, Arizona didn't conform, although it was about a year later they finally made their decision. But Arizona will probably assume that. So the other catch is to understand if you're going to be filing and the federal return shows a subtraction for unemployment compensation, how should you file with the state to properly report? And then on top of that, even if the state tells you the direction they're going, there may be some additional information that will be attached to the return. For instance, if you just tried to add it back on Arizona, assuming that, hey, you know, they're going to tax it again. Well, that's great, but depending upon how they implement adding it back, we may very well find that your other addition might not be picked up by their computer and your client will still get a, you know, a mailer coming out wanting them to pay tax on this amount that they don't believe they paid tax on before. So we have that complication. The second problem, which is a little more significant, I think, you know, because I think the states, you're probably comfortable with how your state's going to react. And, you know, so unless you're dealing with a client who's out of your state and, you know, you're trying to figure out right now what, you know, let's say the state of Utah would normally do for this and you haven't ever really done much with Utah, yeah, you have a little work there. But the bigger issue, I think, comes with the potential of setting ourselves up to make big mistakes. What do I mean by that? Well, if you go ahead and you manually overwrite, and it probably will work right, your software has a way to put an entry on that line, and you can put a description in. You put your description as UCE, put in parentheses the exclusion, and then put that exclusion in the actual line for that. So you can probably get that on the return. It will compute properly, assuming you properly computed the exclusion, and the IRS can probably handle it. But the danger is eventually our software is going to be updated to automatically make these computations. And that's where you have a risk involved at this point. If you're not careful and either don't recognize that your software got updated for this, which is easier to do in some cases than others. It depends on different pieces of software, how rapidly they update and how clear they are on what they're doing when they update. But if your software doesn't update or updates that later, you have to remember if your client's one of those clients who holds on to their return, you know, you put it out here so they can file it right away and they sit on it until May 12th because, hey, you know, they got until May 17th this year, so why not wait? And then after they do it, they notice that, oh, I forgot to tell you about this $500 worth of dividends. I got a brand new brokerage account. So you go back, put that 500 in. Now, you might be thinking that's no big deal, right? You'll double check that the 500 worked right, that it changed the dividend line appropriately. But it's close to the deadline. Are you going to catch the fact that, uh-oh, we had that subtraction already in there manually? Because, again, by mid-May, will you remember who was the manual fix and who was the automatic and who was fixed by your software? So we'll go back and we won't necessarily notice that hey, we're now double subtracting because your tax software will probably not figure out that you had subtracted it. And your, you know, the tax software will go ahead and put another UCE description and probably the exact same amount of exclusion. 
doubling it up. So we have a risk. Now, as I said when I started this section, there are two classes of returns, right? What about those returns that were already filed? And there's quite a few of those out there. Well, the IRS is being clear right now. They do not want you to file amended returns either on this or on any other of these issues. You know, anything else that's under this program, the main thing will be the premium tax credit payments and the fact that you may have paid back the premium tax credit, uh, the premium tax credit advance, and you paid part of it back because you didn't qualify for that much. And now Congress is saying, oh, we're going to forgive that whole thing. So now you're trying to get the money back. Yeah, don't amend for that either. Uh, the commissioner testifying before the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Oversight uh, did say this week that, you know, the service is going to try to be issuing refunds directly so that taxpayers do not have to file amended returns, uh, presumably both for the unemployment and for the premium tax credit issue. We'll see how good they get at that and how long it takes. But they definitely don't want amended returns right now. And honestly, as slowly as they're processing amended returns at the moment, not exactly like your client's going to get their money the next week if you try to push an amended return through. So probably makes sense for the moment to wait on the IRS and hope that they are able to automate this distribution for taxpayers who filed a tax return that had the unemployment as taxable. Now let's talk about a letter the AICPA wrote. And it's interesting because what this letter does is goes into something that we've kind of known has been a problem uh, ever since the Paycheck Protection Program uh, loans were created and the forgiveness was created. And this is a problem we have with the PPP loans and how they interact with flow-through entities, partnerships, and S-corporations. So this is technically a letter titled A Request for Additional Guidance and Proposed Solutions for the Tax Treatment of tax exempt Income from Forgiven Paycheck Protection Program Loans to Partnerships and S-Corporations, a letter written by the AICPA to the IRS. It was dated March the 15th. So on, you know, on the March 15th day, pass through day, they ran this through. Now, PPP loan forgiveness essentially created a lot of issues for pastors. And we'll talk about them here, but there's basically three the AICPA is going to, going to go. Right? So, but initially, just getting that forgiveness created some issues for us because we had to worry about when do you get forgiveness? Because that was kind of an issue because. When you get forgiveness, there is an increase in basis. It's tax-exempt income. And they made that very clear in the year-end bill on December 27th. But even without that, if you go back to the 2001 Gitlis case, which Congress did override in result, but not in reasoning, and their override was very, very narrow. So the fact is, the logic still stands that tax-exempt income earned by an S corporation increases the basis of the stock of the shares, which we knew. And even if it is tax exempt income, that is, you know, from a cancellation of debt structure, because that's what it was there. What Congress did was fixed it. So section 108 doesn't really do that anymore, but this forgiveness was not under section 108. So we already knew it would increase basis, but when we added in the fact that the deductions, right? We're going to allow deductions for expenses used for forgiveness. That put in additional problems. And there's a lot of issues that come up. Let's start with the first problem that we have, which is the PPP loan. You know, we got a PPP loan of $120,000. That's $120,000 cash. And presumably, if we want forgiveness, we have to spend it on expenses, expenses which would normally be deductible. And post the December 27th bill, yes, we're going to get a federal tax deduction for them. Well, here comes our problem. Those expenses, normally expenses paid into that goes into non-separately state income, reduce our basis in our stock. And they would anyway. They will no matter how we do it. So our basis is going to go down. We pay those expenses. However, you know, the forgiveness will add to our basis, 
But that won't happen until we, you know, we decide that the actual forgiveness has taken place, that we have a recognition event. So the problem that we run into is essentially this. So let's talk about a shareholder that begins the year of 2020 with no basis. Okay, during the year, the company got PPP loan proceeds of $250,000. The company, we if we hadn't paid the expenses paid with the loans, we hadn't gotten the loans, the company would have broken even. So because of this, we got $250,000 of expenses paid. Now, many taxpayers discovered you couldn't even try to submit a forgiveness application to your bank before the end of December. And actually, it turns out that in many ways in the PP loan program, it was probably better if you hadn't, especially once we discovered what we want to do to get the employee retention credit to work with this. But ignore that. If you take the position that there was not yet any forgiveness, there's no tax exempt income. Since there's no tax exempt income, if we're looking at an S corporation, our problem is that S corporation debt of an S corporation does not increase the basis of the shareholder's interest in the S-corporation. Now, in a partnership, it does, but we'll get to a partnership here in just a second, and it's problem. But we don't have the increase, so the problem is here with my shareholder, I had no basis to start the year, and the only thing we have coming out on this return is going to be the, you know, the basically ordinary loss of $250,000. We have no basis to claim the loss. We, we can't claim the loss yet because of that forgiveness. Now, in 2021, we submit our application for forgiveness to the bank. And if you take the position that that's when the forgiveness takes place, then in 2021, yeah, we'll get basis. And presumably, we might be able to deduct that 250. But remember, 2020 is the last year that we can carry back net operating losses from. And we may very well have had a loss this year. 2021, even if we have a bad year, that loss only goes forward. So that loss would have been more valuable in many cases back in 2020 than in 2021. But because of our, ba our lack of basis in this case, you know, we're just stuck. Now, it may not be that you started with zero basis, but I think a lot of people, even if they're not going to lose all of the deductions or have them deferred till the next year, they're still going to find that this, you know, this extra money that came in, that didn't create any basis but allowed you to pay expenses, it's going to create a situation where you're going to have more expenses paid than you have basis to absorb the expenses. And that's the problem. Now, if it's a partnership, there's a little bit of a different problem. In a partnership, as I said, the partners get allocated the debt, and that does add to their basis. So basis is not a problem. But in a partnership, this particular loan is considered non-recourse. Uh, under the rules we have here for the Paycheck Protection Program, both variants, the loan itself is non-recourse in the absence of fraud. So even if the company can't pay, uh, the owner is not going to be on the hook for having to pay it back. The shareholder won't be there. The partners won't be there. Well, the problem is that renders it into a non-recourse debt and since it's not going to be a qualified non-recourse debt, right? it's not going to meet those requirements, uh, we're out of at risk. We have amounts not at risk. And when we finally do get forgiveness, that additional basis and tax-exempt income will increase our basis and allow the deduction. The similar problem can occur here that we're going to not going to get our losses in 2020, not going to get any of them or not get a good chunk of them in 2020, and they'll be picked up in 21. There's a second problem for S corporations, and this deals with the problem of the accumulative adjustments account. Now, for those of you who remember your S corporation rules, the accumulative adjustment account really serves one purpose in life uh, to determine how much we can distribute before we begin to pay out any accumulated earnings and profits that the S corporation might have. Now, if the S corporation has never been an S corporation and never ceases to be an S corporation, AAA may become, in fact, will be generally utterly irrelevant. We won't care about AAA. But if you have an S corporation that used to be a C corp, 
an elected S. If you have an S corporation that merged with a C corp and therefore had some earnings and profits got merged in with it. Or if you have an S corporation where you revoke or, you know, in essence, have your S corporation, uh, you know, election either, you know, revoked or terminated, uh, you have the one year post termination transition period to pay out those S earnings that may still be inside the S corp. So AAA matters there as well. And here's our problem. So let's take an example where we have an S corporation has $100,000 in its AAA account coming into 2020 at 100,000 of earnings and profits and has, you know, basically at that point. And the other adjustments account, because everybody loves that account. And for that, that account really doesn't matter for anything. It's, it's a place we put things so that we don't go crazy uh, because we don't have any place to put something. But it really is never used for anything. But let's say that's at zero to get everybody happy. Well, first thing is we, we, we get basically a PPP loan, right, in that case. So if we have our PPP loan in that case, so we're looking at our PPP loan in this case, and we're looking at this as our item, right? So our problem is when the PPP loan is forgiven, right, when, when we end up getting our PPP loan forgiven, that is tax-exempt income. Under Section 1368 E, or yeah, E1 Cap A, tax exempt income does not increase AAA. And under Regulation 1.1368, uh, you know, dash 2A, as I recall, comes in again, we have essentially the same result, right? It does not increase AAA, right? AAA is not increased by that. But our deductions are going into non-separately stated income. And in non-separately stated income, generally under the regulations that we have under 1368, which is Reg 1.1368-2A3I, it tells us that AAA is reduced by non-separately stated losses, which is where it's going to hide. So the problem is at this point now, again, I started with 100,000 cumulative adjustments, 100,000 in earnings and profits. And so now I have $250,000 of income, $250,000 of deductible expenses. Assume I have sufficient basis. I take a $100,000 distribution out during the year. Well, since I don't have any, in fact, I have negative AAA at this point, $150,000, that $100,000 is going to come out of the earnings and profits. That's going to be a taxable dividend. And that's the problem here, right? We have a taxable dividend in that stays because what's going to happen is the loan is going to be trapped behind earnings and profits. That's $250,000 of cash. That's actually cash at some point that will be available for distribution, you know, assuming you didn't just blow it per permanently and that doesn't really matter. So there's a real problem. If you get profitable again, you're going to have this chunk of money. It's going to have to stay in the S Corp. You don't want to pay out the dividend because it's going to have to sit there because you're going to hit the point where in this case, you have $250,000 of prior basis ads that are stuck behind the earnings and profits account. So the AICPA was looking to try to figure out how to make this work better. You know, how do we handle it? Now, I can tell you that one interesting thing is under 1368E1A, the, the code section, it says that we also don't reduce AAA by expenses related to tax exempt income. Now, if these things paid with the loan are expenses related to tax exempt income, by the way, is the position that the IRS took early last year right, when they thought that, you know, basically Congress was going to keep quiet on the issue of deductibility, they said these were expenses related to tax exempt income. As such, they would have moved outside of AAA. They would not have reduced AAA. If you want to think of it this way, they would have reduced the other adjustments account. That, that just makes me cringe a bit because the code never mentions the other adjustment account. But hey, you know, it, it's one of those things that ends up happening. In which case, then, now we don't have a problem because our 100000 would remain in cumulative adjustment accounts in this fact because the 250 positive and 250 negative would both be in other adjustments 
And that means 100000 coming out would be a return of previously taxed earnings. And we would be able to, you know, take that money out without having to worry about picking up a tax dividend. Well, what did the AICPA request? Well, so there, there's a couple of things here. Uh, first, one thing they wanted to look at here is that mention of what's our timing for inclusion for cancellation of debt. Remember, our problem was if we spend the money in 20, but we don't get formal cancellation till 21, we have lack of basis in many cases to claim the loss, or potentially even worse, if we took a distribution, we might have had created a taxable distribution in excess of our basis because we didn't have sufficient basis to support the distribution that was taken. So the IRS says, okay, or I should say the AICPA says, we think that really the key here is we really should have some sort of matching. And the most obvious matching, you know, that just makes sense and in their ideas, their eyes achieves Congress's goal of having this be tax neutral in this regard would be for the cancellation of debt to be deemed to take place as the money is spent on these expenses. So if I spend $500 on payroll that's going to result in $500 of debt cancellation, I should be able to treat that as $500,000 of tax exempt income which means I can claim the full deduction for those expenses and I get the extra basis. I don't need to wait. Therefore, if I get my whole PPP loan funds expended before the end of December, those funds would end up being uh, essentially, you know, added to basis. Now, and the ISPA says, look, we can justify this. Look, here, let's think about this. If you have a loan of less than $50,000 under the current law, all a borrower has to do is submit the application, fill in the right lines. The, you know, the SBA or the bank is not going to really look at much of anything except to make sure you filled in lines. Yes, they could audit it down the line, but again, they're, they're not going to. There's no front end work to be done, which means that in the ASCPA's views, this becomes a merely ministerial act. There's really no decisions being made. You know, as soon as this drops in and the bank accepts it, you know, we're, we're going to get the formal forgiveness. So for all practical purposes, everything except the very final ministerial act has taken place and the forgiveness should be deemed to happen as we spend the money. They note that even for loans above 150 below 2 million, there's not a whole lot being done by the banks to verify this. And those are going to be pretty, you know, minor amount of work done to verify things. And they think that potentially is ministerial as well. And while they admit for loans above $2 million, where the AI, where the SBA has committed to actually examining those loans and you know raising questions about them, they're saying even there, though, those are such a small number overall that just for simplicity and to achieve matching and avoid the basis problems that we talked about here, uh, we really should just be able to take it as we spend the money. So that, that's kind of the AICPA's rules that even though those $2 million loans, maybe they're not as clear, we really should get it for everything. Now, I think their commentary on $2 million plus loans is anticipating the objection of the SBA. And I wouldn't be surprised if the back door they're thinking, okay, we raised that differential and maybe it's not persuasive as to why they should get the waiver as well. But at least we probably put in their mind that, okay, your problem are just these people. So maybe these people don't get it treated under that rule, but everybody else does. So, you know, the IRS should allow it for all the others to do it with a straight up, you know, as you spend the money, you are deemed to have the debt canceled. And then those that got $2 million plus loans, okay, we'll let them wait until we get the more formal work because that's not merely ministerial. Next thing they asked for is they talked about the accumulative adjustment accounts and the PPP forgiveness related expenses. That problem we mentioned already where we trap the loan amount behind earnings and profits because the expenses are being put into AAA. If you do the regulation literally as written, regulation 1.1368-2A3I, then it works exactly like that. You reduce AAA. But you don't increase AAA by the debt forgiveness because that's tax-exempt income. 
Now, the ASCPA says, look, that's contrary to congressional intent to have it trapped back there. And realistically, you should just say that we can take part of that, you know, those expenses and move them over outside of AAA and move them onto the other adjustment account, or like I said, basically nowhere, but not dirty up AAA with these, or reduce AAA with these expenses, because that's not really what Congress meant. And, you know, I would probably go a step further and say, I think the regulation is contrary to the plain language of IRC Section 1368E1 Cap A, at least once you realize that if Congress creates a deductible and expense related, say, a item related tax exempt income and expense, if they go back and say, yes, we're going to allow a current deduction for that, well, that wouldn't change the fact it's related to tax exempt income, but it would change the fact that it's now going to be deducted in that non separately state income. And so my theory would be that the regulation obviously assumed that 265A1 would always block being able to deduct those expenses so they would never end up in non separately state income, and therefore it wasn't a problem. non separately state income or loss would never have these expenses that related to the forgiveness of indebtedness. Now, suddenly, we find out that as Congress changes, they do. So, yeah, I, I think that's it. And so we get those expenses excluded from AAA. Uh, you know, we get all of that stuff taken care of to enable us to hopefully, you know, not have a bunch of whatever our loan amount is permanently trapped behind earnings and profits. Okay. Finally, the AICPA said, uh, we want to deal with this question. I've been asked more than once. You know, there are two questions on Form 1065, or I should a question on 1065, and a similar question on um, 1060, or say 1120S, which asks very simply, during the tax year, did the entity have any non-shareholder debt that was canceled or non-owner debt? that was canceled, forgiven, or had terms modified so as to reduce the principal amount of the debt. Now, if you take that question literally, then the answer should clearly be yes. If you have a PP loan, that has been forgiven. But the AICPA says, really, that's not useful to you, the IRS. You know, this is supposed to tell you if you should have some sort of pickup of income. If there's a Section 108, you know, you should see a Form 982 attached to the return explaining you see some reduction of basis, all these things that should happen under traditional Section 108 or just straight up the standard rules for tax and cancellation of indebtedness. But in this case, it doesn't matter. So the AICPA said, IRS, will you please say that for purposes of this question, do not treat a PPP loan as debt. So ignore that. For purposes of this question, do not treat a PPP loan as debt to at least to the extent that it is going to, it has been or is going to be forgiven based on the expenditure of these funds, right? Quit treating it as that. Maybe if they have a cancellation for other reasons, uh, they actually end up being liable, but they can't pay, then, okay, that might be different, but that's not what's happening this year. And as the ACP says, ACPA says that you're not really getting information by this question, the way it's rigged. So we'll see what happens. This has been the interesting problem that the IRS has I should say that we've had ever since we got into this whole pass-through entities. And I've answered the question about what to do about AAA so many times. It's crazy. As well as the question of what to do about those questions on the have you had a forgiveness or cancellation. Have a lot of people getting worked up over those. We'll see if the IRS actually gives us guidance. Now, finally, to close out this time, let's talk about what was published by the IRS, uh, Tax Day for Individual for Individuals Extend to May 17th, Treasury IRS Extend Filing and Payment Deadline, IRS News Release 2021-59, issued on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2021. The IRS was coming under increasing pressure to extend the filing deadline. In fact, what happened recently, and which I think became the last straw, is that the chairman of House Ways and Means, who I mentioned earlier in a previous letter, had not signed on to request that the IRS move the date back. Suddenly, his name turned up on a letter. 
as well. The commissioner was going to be coming to talk to the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Oversight this week, and this conveniently came out the day before of his testimony because it was pretty clear he was going to be grilled about why aren't you pushing back the filing deadline. He had already tried to explain that. It didn't appear it went over well with Congress. My guess is it would not have gone over well again. So he you know, came out and said, okay, we're going to do this. Now, this extension is not last year's extension. And there are a number of things that are different. First, it's much shorter. This extends the time to file Form 1040 for calendar year 1040 and to pay the tax on that calendar year 2020 1040 all up until Monday, May 17th, 2021. Now, obviously, May 15th is a Saturday, 17th of Monday. So we're on the 17th because that's the next business day after the 15th, a one-month delay. So, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll pick that up on that standpoint that we have that one-month delay. Now, you may remember uh, one thing I want to remind you of. Remember when we talked about recalculating the uh, economic impact payment for 2021 if the return was processed by the IRS before a certain date. And as I told you, if they kick that back to June 15th, the filing deadline, then September 1st would become the date. Well, they didn't go that far. They only kicked back 30 days. So now it appears under this ruling, since it's going to be the 17th, 90 days from that is actually will be August 15th because we're going to lose two days uh, due to the fact that, um, you know, July, June, July and August both have 31 days. Or I should say May, right, get, get it right. May and, Ju- May and July have 31 days. June doesn't. So that, that takes two days out, right? Basically, we go over 92 days to get to the 15th from the 15th of May, but we're not coming to the 15th. We're coming for two days later. So, yeah, it'll have to be processed by the 15th of May. If the IRS, for whatever reason, pushes back this date one more time, and they do it under Section 7508, Cap A. That's the other thing. Still, currently, we don't have the actual IRS notice about how they're going to do this. But they didn't extend everything. First, key that a lot of people notice because they say right off the news release, the quarter one 2021 estimated tax payments are still going to be due on April 15th, not May 15th. Now, I've had a lot of people ask, what if we, you know, okay, we're underpaid, we get to May, we notice that, oh man, they should have paid 5000 on that estimate, but they didn't. And the client's going to be upset because they don't want to pay penalties. And there's going to be this late payment penalty. And so some people are going to ask, well, can I just extend the return at June 15th, overpay by five grand, and then apply it to the next year and have that go ahead and count as being paid on April 15th? My answer to that is right now, we don't know. But I'm very concerned if it's clear that the money was not in there on April 15th, I have a feeling the IRS would try to seriously find a way to make that penalty apply if the numbers were at all significant. So I I think you warn clients, I don't think you plan unless the IRS says applying an overpayment is automatically going to be considered to be paid on April 15th, regardless of when you actually put the money in. So April 15th of 2021 for the estimated tax payments for the 21 return. If we don't get that kind of guidance, I think you got to tell clients, yeah, we're going to have to file uh, estimates by April 15th. Uh, just assume we need those. that We're not going to have an option to do our extensions in May. So that's probably one of the big issues. Now, a number of other forms are not extended. So let's talk about what's not. Form 1041 for trusts and estates due on April 15th for calendar years. And for trusts, that's virtually every trust will be that date. Uh, Some estates. Well, the problem is that no other entity types were extended. So based on the IRS news release right now, it seems very clear that 1041s are going nowhere. They're not going to get the extension, you know, out to May to get them filed. So you're still going to have to file any extensions on a trust or estate by April 15th if it's not filed by then. 
Also, same thing for Form 1120 for C corporations on a calendar year. They're going to be due April 15th. There is no automatic extension to May 15th. Similarly, if you have an entity that's on extension and the extension terminates on June the 30th, Unlike last year, where their relief ended up pushing those dates all the way to July 15th, this year, it looks like the IRS are going to try to avoid doing that. There are also some things that just aren't clear, but I think probably are extended. One they never really say you can do it is the extension form, the 4868. Uh, how do I get extended to October 15th? Well, they don't really say yet because, again, they're trying to carve a very narrow group out this time. Last time they had a very broad group. So, you know, are they going to carve the 4868 out of this rule? And does that mean we're going to have to go ahead and write a check? Even if we're overpaid, we're going to have to write a check on April 15th in order to not be underpaid for the other, for the other state that the taxpayer may have moved to. So we have that problem. We're also not clear that the Form 709, the U.S. gift tax return, is going to be extended if you, you know, is, is extended based on this either. So it is possible that if you don't get it filed by April 15th and don't send in an extension request, which can be standalone, you don't have to use the 4868 for it. 4868 will cover it, but you don't need to use it. And there will probably be at least some concern if you're going to try to use the 4868, well, what happens if we actually get the individual return done before May 15th and we just go ahead and file that? We never had a federal extension for the individual. So, you know, is that a problem? And I think it might be. So we need to be a little careful of 709s. We also have not gotten full clarification whether IRAs and health savings account contributions for 2020, do they have to be in by April 15th, what we've been planning on all along? Or do they get until the 27th of, June, of basically, of, or yeah, get that right. I'll make it say, we get to the 17th of May, get that stated correctly. That 27th of my mind from the year in bill. Okay. Now, there's other problems here too. States are a huge problem. Now, interestingly enough, I have heard of a lot of states that have already announced they're conforming. If they can do it administratively, we're seeing a lot of states announce conformity, including some that last time tried to do it in the legislature and decided that was a disaster. And so it's coming back now and just having the governor just declare an emergency and declare an extension of these dates. And so it's kind of interesting to watch that. But yeah, that, that's what's happening is Departments of Revenue. Some of them are doing it, but not all. Here in Arizona, we still don't have any word about what Arizona is going to do about this extended due date. We hope they're going to extend it, but we don't know for sure. If it's like last year, don't be surprised if a couple of states do not extend. So you'll be in there. The other big thing, the IRS is going to be issuing formal guidance on this delayed filing date somewhere in the future, and that's going to be crucial. A key thing to watch is do they use 7508 cap A as their justification or have they come up with some other way of moving it? And that's important because remember I told you about that delay where the processing date gets pushed back so a taxpayer could get an updated uh, economic incentive payment if the date got pushed back. But it did say push back under 7508 Cap A. If they find a way to push it back another using another mechanism, like let's say the generic rule that the IRS uh, can grant extensions to file tax returns generally, uh, they have a right to do that just on their own. Uh, if if that rule were to, you know, if they were to use that rule, then we might not get that extra time to get the return processed. I don't think they'll use that rule because that rule does not work to waive interest. And the IRS can't waive interest generally, as they've uh, told us for years on the law, even though they can waive the penalty. So the IRS could waive the penalty for filing late. The IRS could waive, you know, could basically say it's extended and there's no fair to pay penalty for that month. So we could have all that taken care of. But what I don't think they could take care of would be the interest. So I think it's going to be 7508, but keep your eye on it just to make sure. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments here for this week here 
in March, March 22nd. As always, you can go ahead and tune back in here next week. We'll talk about whatever comes up in the coming week. I do have a session coming up on uh, March 30th, which originally I thought was going to be way late in tax season. And why would anybody you know, want to come and listen to it then? Now it's like not nearly as bad. We are going to spend three hours for the New Jersey Society of CPAs, NJCPA, uh, talking about the big changes that have occurred in the past month. That will include the you know, American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. It will include some of the IRS relief provisions that we've seen, whatever we have to date from the IRS, and talk about other things that have been happening. That impact is including changes to PP loan program. If you're not aware, the House has passed a bill that would extend the loan program for another two months. So it'd be the end of May, which I find to be hilarious because then, you know, we're going to finish tax season just in time for some clients to be madly scrambling, trying to get their loans applications in. Uh, The House bill would also, though, allow the SBA to continue paying out processing applications that were in by the end of May. They continue processing those after that date. The Senate wants to make some changes. I would expect that especially we're going to see changes in the area about whether somebody who already got a loan as a sole proprietor because they got in early, uh, if they can now get that extra disbursement, even though their loan may have already been forgiven. Would be surprised to see something like that added, a few other things being discussed. But we may have an extension of the PP loan program. So that's something also to keep your eye on. Uh, you know, but we're gonna have that June the 30th, I should say June, March the 30th session with New Jersey CPA, NJCPA. You can register at NJCPA's uh, website. And if you go there, you know, you can sign up and we'll have the course. It will be a webcast, not gonna be live. Uh, it's still tax season and it's still it's still pandemic time here. Uh, so, no, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, flying to New Jersey uh, to do this in person live because, yeah, that's not how it's going to work uh, for a couple of reasons. New Jersey society is not doing live sessions at this point in time, or I should say in person sessions. It is live CPE. And, of course, I'm probably not traveling at that point either. So I'm still in the middle of vaccines, you know, in the middle of the whole vaccine regime. So we'll be doing that. But again, on the 30th, hopefully see a few of you there. Otherwise, we will talk to you back here next week when we come up with whatever comes up during the week on current federal tax developments.